Welcome to second session. My name is Kendall Ho. I'm a practicing emergency physician at the Vancouver General Hospital. I'm also a director of eHealth Strategy Office at UBC Faculty Medicine. And uh, really a, a pleasure and honor for me to be here. And thanks to Gloria, thanks to Andrew, and thanks to the conference organizer for inviting me to chair this session. You will have four really excellent talks about how technology is serving health. In the earlier panel, there are a lot, a lot of conversations about, well, technology, how does that apply to health? That's one of the several domains that Alex talked about. And so this session is to more deeply explore that. Is not only are there great, cool technologies, but is it useful? Can we rely on them? Is there evidence that support its use? Can we make it better? I think our four speakers will give you some insights into that. I'd also like to give you some uh, really interesting background statistics to kind of uh, salt the conversation, if you will. Uh, this is a survey, of, uh, an internet survey, of uh, the millennials. I have two kids, I have a 21-year-old and 19-year-old, so I'm very interested in this crowd. Uh, and in fact, they were talking about my kids. You know, what would you like to use technology for? Six out of 10 will use it for telehealth so that they can see doctors and do stuff. 70% want a mobile app prescription. So they want doctors to prescribe mobile apps to them and say, use this one for it. And 63% uh, want wearables, six out of 10. So, not too surprising, as you go down further, the, the second last one, you know, they want 3D printing for prosthetics, and uh, also <laughs> cutting edge technology, like swallowing a pill, so that you can uh, track that. So you think, well, this is great, you know, younger generation, they like it. But look at the next, look at the next survey, very interesting. They survey people 65 years or older in the United States on this survey. 1,015 people answered, two thirds of individuals would like to use the technology in your pocket, your phone, for health. Here's some, some of the additional statistics. They estimate about 3.9 million people will turn 65 this year in the United States alone. Look at the top five use of technology. Self-care tools, wearables, online communities that they can discuss and advise from the peers, navigating the health system, and also health record use, to access your own health records and to be able to leverage that for your own health management with your health professional partnership. I wonder how you feel about those five things. And in fact, at the discussion, I welcome a reflection on that. And in fact, in a medical journal just uh, recently published uh, in January 2015 in JAMA, uh, looking at digital medical tools and sensors, uh, this is a really interesting table. The font's a little bit small, but it speaks to the fact that as world population grows to 7.2 million in 2015 to 7.6 2020, look at the use of sensors. The rising in 2010 with 20 million sensors to this year estimated to be 10 billion sensors used, more than the world population. But of course, each of us may use more than one sensor, and then this market will rise to a trillion much more rapid than population growth as anticipated. Uh, this is just a quick map to show you what sensors are now available in 2015. Now available. If you look at that top right corner, that little you know, fan-shaped thing, that's actually a helmet to measure how much of a concussion force you have when you play sports. We look at the wrist, of course, there's a lot of interest about using wristwatch. And we look at the foot, measuring your balance, your walk, and how your physiology responds to the environment. So all these are coming. So what's the hype and what's the evidence? How do we sort it out so that we don't just go after the cool, but go after the useful and go after those that can actually help us live more healthier? Our panelists today will help us with that. Let me first introduce our first panelists. Again, you have all their uh, bio, so I won't go into details in description, but I'd like to invite Sue Lefkoff here. Uh, Sue is the director of the Smart State Sensor Smart Center of Economic Excellence and a chair in this research in the University of South Carolina. And uh, welcome her to speak about the focus on the medication adherence app, and she also mentioned about remote monitoring. Sue. Great. Thank you so much. Um, that was a great entree into what I'm going to be talking about. Um, so the, the title on, um, in the brochure says that I was speaking on remote monitoring following hospital discharge and a medication adherence app for older adults. But since Anne Marie, who is our next speaker, is going to be speaking on um, 
remote monitoring following hospital discharge for congestive heart failure, which is exactly what I was going to be talking about, I decided not to focus on that. And in my 15 minutes, I'm going to be talking about the medication app for uh, medication adherence for chronic disease. And the specific chronic disease that I'm going to be talking about is HIV. And when I was talking to my colleague, Bill Kearns, and telling him what I've chosen to speak about here, he said, well, that's interesting. People might not see that as something that's you know, that, that important among um, seniors. But um, in fact, it is, although the population of older adults with HIV AIDS is smaller than um, other age groups. It is rising significantly for a lot of reasons, and I didn't want to, I don't have time to talk about that today, but um, I'll talk about that if anybody has any questions. Um, but as I talk about um, these issues, they're very much the same for other chronic diseases. It's just I'm going to be focusing on it for HIV. So in terms of HIV, we know that with antiretroviral therapy, ART, HIV AIDS has become a chronic condition, unlike when I was growing up, when it was a death, it was a diagnosis that you were going to die if you got this. Um, the good thing is that high levels of ART translates into sustained HIV suppression, re reduced risk of drug resistance, improved overall health, quality of life, and also it substantially increases the survival rate among HIV positive patients so that it is a chronic disease. It's no longer a death sentence. And we know that poor adherence leads to negative health outcomes for patients such as increased hospitalizations, poor quality of life, um, and greatly increases the risk of transmission, transition, transmission to partners, spelt wrongly, I apologize. So we know that ART adherence is key for reducing patient morbidity and mortality, as well as for reducing healthcare utilization and overall costs. What are the barriers to medication adherence? They include age-related barriers, um, with aging comes increased allostatic load, which leads to development, to decrements in memory and cognitive processes. There are also disease-related barriers. With HIV, there's a premature aging of the immune system that also accelerates cognitive decline. There are also medication-related problems. Just the side effects of these, of these therapies, these cocktail treatments, are just very, very difficult to handle. The psychosocial barriers are um, people are aware of, people have increased depression, which makes it difficult to maintain um, their medication regimens. The stress burden of these regimens also leads to poor adherence. And the lack of social support is key. Also, the importance of medication self-efficacy. That's a very important factor that if people can feel confident in their ability to maintain their treatment adherence regimens. In addition to these barriers, there, there are barriers. My, my focus in my research has mostly been on delivery of care and services to health um, disparity populations. So in addition to all of these barriers, we have the additional barriers that are faced by people from um, populations that are you know, from ethnic minority groups and from lower socioeconomic status groups. Just physical distance to care, lack of transportation to care, <laughs> lack of knowledge. The infrastructure at the clinical sites where people get care is often limited. And the economic costs, um, which we've talked about earlier, as well as the cultural, the cultural issues. When, when services are not provided in a way that are, that are, that's consistent with people's beliefs and cultural values, it's very difficult for them to utilize those services. So there was a, there was a very good review. I wished I'd seen the one that you just spoke of um, last January in 2015. I had not seen that overview, but in 2013, there was an overview of M Health medication adherence interventions for HIV as well as chronic diseases. And it was interesting because this is an issue, um, this is an issue that um, there were 1,500 articles that were identified um, for the systematic review. The, the systematic review um, actually focused on only 20 of those articles because only 20 of those articles met the criteria to be um, included in the, um, in the review. Um, and the reasons were a lack of randomized trials, all, all kinds of reasons, but literally from 1,500 to 20 that were included in this review. In addition, 680 of those um, were commercial applications in which there were no, um, no published data um, outside of the, um, the commercial entity and no randomized trials, so they were excluded also. So that's just something that, again, it relates to my 
question earlier about the cognitive enhancement um, interventions, you know, without the evidence of the randomized trial, which we don't have in these interventions because, as Alex said, because the technologies are coming on board and changing so rapidly, there's no time to do that and no money to do that. But it's an issue. So again, so I just wanted to bring that up as something to think about because being the academic that I am. Um, so, so basically, the, the M Health interventions with mobile health applications out there, they mostly include um, messaging, um, including medication reminders and educational and motivational texts. Sometimes they include telephone consults with care providers. Study results are really mixed. I mean, there was increased adherence in 65% of the 20 studies that were reviewed. Most even of those 20 were not in randomized clinical trials control trials. Most did not include process data to assess the fidelity of the study implementation. So we don't really know what made it work if it did work. Um, also, a lot, of these, um, a lot of these articles, they don't rely on behavioral change theories to explain kind of what is the logic model that you're predicting, how, what are the processes through which people go through, and how does the behavior actually change. And because of the methodological and clinical heterogeneity in all these studies, it, it, you can't do any kind of a meta-analysis, which I think one of the earlier speakers said was, um, I think that was Alex, that he showed in one of his slides that the randomized control trial or the meta-analysis was the best way to actually look at effectiveness. So we do know that there are theoretical approaches to behavioral change that work and that have been demonstrated. Social cognitive theory with Bandura, self-efficacy, the more you feel treatment, uh, medication um, adherence, self-efficacy, the higher likelihood that you will be adherent to your medication regimen, health beliefs model, the, and that's with, the, and then the health beliefs model from Rosenstock, the, the, your belief that um, in the treatment that it's going to be effective increases your, um, your um, um, medication adherence and stress and coping, the more you can reduce your stress burden is likely to increase your ability to um, um, adhere. So we did formative research to generate text messages. We, we had a multicultural team. We had expertise and someone else talked about this. No one discipline can do this alone. You've got to reach out across the disciplines. You've got to learn how to talk together and learn each other's languages. We had people with, in health psychology, HIV clinical care, health communications, minority age. All of us, we came together drafting motivational and educational text messages. Um, the educational messages focused on maintaining healthy lifestyles because people with a chronic disease, like something as focused as HIV, they tend to forget other parts of their life and people often have comorbid chronic conditions that they have to also be um, involved with um, maintaining, um, maintaining activities around. Motivational messages are very important. How do you motivate people to, to, feel them, to keep them empowered and optimistic so that they'll maintain their, their um, positive um, adherence behavior. We conducted a focus group, and we, my, all of my research focuses on different ethnic minority populations. In this particular group, we were focusing on African Americans because in Columbia, South Carolina, where I live, it's a huge problem, um, HIV, um, AIDS in, in the African American community. It's, it's, we're, we're considered one of, a, one of the hot spots um, um, for HIV AIDS in, um, in the country for the states um, by the CDC, um, South Carolina is. Um, so we had a focus group of um, African Americans age 50 and above. Um, we, we got their feedback on the draft messages and we finalized them based on the, on the feedback from the focus groups. Some examples of them for the motivational messages, you have what it takes to keep up with your meds. Your meds give you life and hope, stay on them. Stay healthy, live longer, live stronger. Some of the health education messages, up with fiber, down with cholesterol, laughter is a natural painkiller, oatmeal is a healthy way to start the day. Here's an example of what our back-end management system looks like. And again, the group that I told you we all brought together from all the disciplines, that was for the development of the, um, that was for the development of the messages. Then we are we are working with our computer um, scientists to actually develop the system. So it truly is a very, very, very much a cross-disciplines um, effort. We had a pilot study, and I was very embarrassed to talk about the numbers here, but thank you, Alex, for you know, mentioning that we have very small numbers. And I, and I, and I looked at the MD2 medication um, um, reminder um, intervention that um, was up there, and I saw there was an N of 12, so at least we surpassed that. This was, 
but this was only our this is only our our, our kind of formative work here. We're going to do an RCT, but in our formative work, we had an eight-week pre-post-test trial, um, 21 HIV-positive African Americans aged over 50 and above. We gave them daily short messages as pill reminders and bi-weekly education and motivational messages. They were delivered through either a standard mobile phone or an Android mobile app, and it was theory-based. Um, so we had our logic model, you know, and our hypothesis was participants who receive daily text messages targeting neurocognitive and affective factors for two months will have improved ART adherence, which was our primary hypothesis, and increased treatment self-efficacy and positive affect, our secondary ones, and we suggested we thought they would be mediators in our logic model to predict um, positive adherence. And we, we, we literally had a very strong outcome. Again, it's a small sample, but we did find that um, perfect adherence, and again, with AR ART, you kind of almost need perfect adherence. You have to be 90% adherent in order for it to be effective. So we're talking about, in terms of chronic disease, it's actually a good thing to look at because you really need to be adherent for this to work. So perfect adherence went from 38% to 86%, which we were happy about. We went back to our group. We had another focus group. We wanted to know what would you recommend for the future, for our future RCT, which we are seeking funding for right now. We've just submitted our phase two grant. It was to um, have opt-in text messages to support smoking cessation. Again, because people tend to forget about other aspects of their lives and how to remain healthy. And this is an important issue. There's a lot of high prevalence of smoking with people who are HIV positive, um, and it's, it's um, it's very important to, um, to focus on that because it has very detrimental effects. Um, they also want a more visual text to reinforce adherence and the option of real-time live care provider support. So what are the implications? Again, the implications, and this is something that I'm not sure where I stand on. Okay, I'm done, and I didn't give you your five minutes. I'm so no, sorry. It, we, need more, we need more quality research, theory-based, RCT with process data. We need to engage patients to change and sustain their health behaviors. A model, as other people have said, it has to be patient-centered, focusing on patients' needs and preferences to motivate people to participate in their own care, and more than one strategy may be needed. Like what we've done is you know, combining um, education, motivational, um, pill reminders. Um, Provider implications, we need to examine the value of linking providers and patients into this broader network. And we need to think about reimbursement mechanisms to spread successful applications throughout the system to both providers and patients. But the, the, the promise for mHealth is that it offers a cost-effective intervention that has the potential to both be spread and sustained. Thank you. So um, I'd like to bring up uh, uh, Anne-Marie Kahn. In your program, it's Martha Mackay. Anne-Marie is partner with uh, Martha in the Heart Center at the St. Paul's Hospital. Anne-Marie is the clinical nurse specialist in the heart failure transplant at St. Paul's Hospital, and uh, she'll be coming up to speak to the experience of a virtual heart clinic. So let's welcome Anne-Marie. Thanks, uh, Kendall, and uh, sorry for the confusion, everyone. It started out being me, and then it was Martha, and then it was me again. Uh, sorry, Gloria, for giving you a nervous breakdown. <clears throat> I hope you all understand Australian. Um, and uh, also, please excuse me in advance. I'm just getting over a cold, so if I start choking and stuff, I don't want Heimlich maneuver. Just, uh, let me <laughs> just hold my hand and look caringly at me. Um, so I want to talk to you a little bit about a, a little clinical system we set up at St. Paul's Hospital. Uh, there's, uh, I've only got like 15 minutes, so I'm going to race you through it so quickly. I'm going to talk to you about what heart failure is, just touch on why it's so expensive, and then explain the virtual heart function clinic. We don't like to say failure in uh, our clinic, so heart function clinic, and then just show one slide about what might be going on in the future. So what is heart failure? Well, uh, for a lot of you will know, but for those who don't, it's a chronic condition and it results in the heart not being able to supply the body with the oxygen and blood it needs to get through life. The things that cause it most frequently is high blood pressure, which a lot of people don't know. So if you want to prevent heart failure, keep your blood pressure under control. Um, 
if you've had a heart attack and you've got damage to the muscle of the heart, that can cause heart failure. And also, if you have heart valve problems, you can end up with heart failure. There's tons of other reasons, but they're probably the three most common reasons. It's a disease of the ageing, so we don't see a lot of heart failure in young people. It's usually in people over the age of 65. What it causes is symptoms that really affect an elderly person's quality of life, anyone's quality of life. Shortness of breath, extreme tiredness, and the big one too is fluid retention because the heart can't pump blood to the kidneys to get rid of it. So it's very uncomfortable. And the bottom line is if you can stop fluid retention, you can help someone uh, fix up the top two symptoms. Like I said, it's a disease of the elderly. Um, Surprisingly, 90, over 93,000 people in BC, it's about 4 million people, uh, have heart failure. So it's about 2% of the population, that's quite a lot of people, and it's very expensive. Um, that's hospitalisation, rehospitalisation, and medication expenses. The readmission rate after you've been admitted to hospital with a diagnosis of heart failure is very high. So 20% or so are readmitted to hospital here in BC within the first 30 days after they've gone home. Why is that? So if any of you uh, have had a hospital uh, stay and you go home from hospital, you're given about 5,000 sheets of paper of instructions. And so you go home, and I'm, I always use my parents as a touchstone, and my mum was in hospital last year, and she came home, she had sheets of paper everywhere. And the pharmacist gave her instructions, and so-and-so gave her instructions, and the OT, and the nurse gave her instructions, and the doctor, and she just didn't know where to, where to start. So this is a huge problem, especially for elderly people who don't have a lot of blood going to their brain because of the heart failure. They may have background dementia and a whole lot of other chronic conditions that they've also gotten instructions about. So these poor people are sitting there uh, thinking, OMG, which is, for the elderly people, that's, uh, oh my God, apparently. <laughs> um, so this is a funny story. I googled images for a confused elderly person. <laughs> and the first thing that came up was George W. Bush. <laughs> um, so anyway, I found this one, so that looks good. So this is the problem. People get home and uh, there they are with all these pills. And you know, one of the big mistakes people make is they have pills that they had from before and then a whole bunch of new ones and then home they come and then they start taking both lots. So and then they come back into hospital because their blood pressure's down in their boots because blah, blah, blah. I can see a lot of people nodding, so they've been there before. So there's a big gap in that transition from hospital to home. Um, you know, we sort of say, bye, see you later, and then what happens? Often the GP hasn't got the discharge summary and the poor person's floating around out there. Um, so... Um, this is sort of a pictorial model of where the problem is. So, you know, what do you do once you get home? I mean, sure, you go to your GP or your specialist in a couple of weeks, but what happens in that crucial couple of weeks when you first get home? And that's when people bounce back into hospital. So managing heart failure for, from a health professional's perspective is pretty easy. It's about restricting fluids restricting sodium or salt intake, and calling someone quickly if you start to get into trouble. So it's pretty simple concepts, but when you've got 100 other things to remember, it's hard. So this is the key to self-management in heart failure. And so what we wanted to do is we wanted to help people in that transition period learn the three simple concepts for self-management. I just, I Googled swollen feet. I thought that was cute. Um, <laughs> So weighing yourself every day is a really big thing in trying to maintain your fluid balance because if you put on three kilos overnight, it ain't fat, it's fluid. Um, the other thing is fluid is, is you know, I used to, my mum had heart failure and I said, mum, you can't drink more than uh, two litres of water a day or a fluid a day because, um, you know, you'll retain fluid. And she was a nurse. And I phoned her a couple of days later. She said, I've stopped drinking water, Amory. I'm going to cut right back. I'm now, I've replaced it with tea. <laughs> so, 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 you know, it's funny, but it's true. This is, people need help. They need, they need guidance along the way. You can't just give them a sheet of paper and say, see you later. So it takes a while to learn this stuff. 
Now, there are all sorts of devices on the market, and I was curious to hear the comments about um, companies, you know, making money and, and, and trying to come up with things that they can make money on. And, and one of the big things uh, that are used in BC, uh, but also around the world, are the, is this home monitoring system, which is a set of scales and a blood pressure cuff that's connected to a phone line. The patient jumps on the scales every day, and uh, it uh, gives feedback about how the patient's doing and connects with the nurse. And it's a great system, and it's been shown to be effective in supporting self-management. Uh, but And there are all sorts of other devices on the market, but our challenge was money. These things cost money, and we have a ton of people with heart failure. We have 800 patients with heart failure in our clinic. And these devices are like seven, $8,000 a piece. Then you've got to go set it up in the patient's home. Then they spill a cup of tea on it, and it gets wrecked, and you have to go out there and fix it up. So we wanted to find a simple, easy way that's accessible to many, many patients to kind of do the same thing, to manage the patient's weight and fluid intake with the support of a nurse uh, so that they can learn how to look after themselves. I found a picture of an old lady's hand using the internet. So we thought, <laughs> let's try the internet. So what we looked at was uh, how many elderly people, or elderly, over 65, I'm going to say, people in Canada are using the internet. Stats Canada d does a great regular survey called internet, uh, household internet use, but they haven't published any results since 2009. But what you can see is there's quite a big increase in internet use in people over 65 years of age. I wish I had more recent data because I'm sure that's much more now. In fact, I see it on the ward, you know, there's little old ladies sitting there with an iPad Skyping with her family. Um, so I'm sure it's much, much more now. Six years is a long time in internet land. So what we did is we scrounged around and found a bit of money and basically came up, I've got to rush through this, basically came up with a system which is an internet-based system and the patient logs on and enters daily weight and reports symptoms compared to the day before. Now, if the symptoms are within the desired range, they, just can, they get positive feedback with a little message and they can print up a little graph and they just continue monitoring. If the weight or symptoms are outside of the individual's desired range, an alert is sent to the nurse in the heart function clinic, and the nurse contacts the patient and uh, coaches them through what to do. So it's not, uh, it says treatment algorithm there, but it's not really a treatment tool. It's more a self-management coaching tool. And, if the, and all over it, you'll see it says, if you're sick, go to the doctor. This isn't designed to sort of jump in and help you. Um, in an acute situation. So we've had three or four versions of this. I just wanted to show you, we're using it clinically. We did a feasibility study, and I'll just show you one slide on that later. But we're now using it in, uh, I think it's nine clinics and practices um, for patients with heart failure. So we have a system that each clinic can set up their own uh, little thing. It's totally free. Um, and that was one of the other things we were really keen to do, is come up with a free, easy to use tool. So the first thing, this is the patient interface. So you can see it's very simple. There's no pop-ups or things to distract people. The font's quite big. Um, and uh, basically, the patient can type in any username they want and password. Uh, so it can be as simple as anything. And they get asked uh, six questions. So this is a fake patient, by the way. Um, so what you can see is your weight today is x kilograms. And you, they can select pounds as well if they want. Um, and compared to yesterday, how would you describe? And then they go through the six uh, questions. And uh, they can also communicate with the nurse if they want to. And it says here, please remember, this isn't to help you if you're feeling terrible. You've got to go to the doctor or the hospital if that's the case. If they put much worse for any of the questions, it sends an alert. If they put a little worse three days in a row or for the same question three times, or for three questions, sorry, in the thing, it'll generate an alert. Or if they send any communication, it generates an alert. Um, if it generates an alert, it uh, says for the patient, you've entered that your weight, this poor lady's increased 14 kilograms in two days. Um, I made it up. Um, uh, a nurse will be contacting you on the next business day uh, to talk to you about ways you might be able to prevent this. So then they go on and they can look at their progress chart. Um, this is an actual patient who's been using it for years. And you can see 
here, uh, they get this feedback. This is their goal weight, which we punch in for them beforehand. And these are the triggers, and they're individual triggers, so this is what will generate an alert. And you can see he actually realised that he, was, he had very slowly over time, over two years, put on weight, and he's really been working hard to get back down to his goal weight. Um, uh, this is his blood pressure, so we can include blood pressure if the patient wants, some patients don't, uh, but this is the patient's blood pressure, and anything in green means that it's okay. If it, an alert's generated, this is the nurse interface, so then the staff can log in, and when the nurse logs in, uh, they get a list of alerts requiring attention, so there are two alerts there, these are the two nurses, and these are the alert descriptions. So as you can see, no data entered in three days or f um, however many days we set generates an alert in case something's happened to the patient. So just to show you, the staff login is the same. So the nurse gets the same interface, but she can see all the patients in her clinic or his, and uh, then responds to the alert by calling the patient, coaches the patient on whatever is going on, and they learn what the appropriate action is. And here's the alert in the patient interface. So the nurse clicks on that, and then he or she can then uh, document the action taken and write a note and resolve it, um, or resolve and print and put it in the patient's chart. Um, there are also, for patients, a ton of resources that we have uh, uh, put on there that they can download fluid balance sheets, information sheets, links that we recommend, etc. And so we've kept it very, very simple. And you know, a lot of people say, why don't you put their medications in there and put this in there and put that in there? But it starts to get more and more complex. We've just wanted a simple little tool that patients can use and they can print up their own graphs, et cetera. Thank you. So patient comments keeps, them focused on, keeps me focused on my health. I'm not gonna read them all, but you can see them there. They're more aware of their health they feel more secure, so it's called supported self-management. And that doesn't happen, what we found is most patients stop using it after um, a couple of months because they feel more confident. As you can see here, we did a feasibility study uh, early on in the piece and we did show that patients felt more confident with their health care. Patients don't only have one chronic disease, so what we're doing uh, now is a study on a similar system that you can use for multiple chronic diseases, um, and you can sort of pick and choose which chronic disease you have, and uh, we'll hopefully be reporting on that soon. Um, the next thing we're starting to work on very briefly is texting, uh, helping patients after discharge using texting. Again, it's not for everyone because many people don't use it, but certainly uh, we're hoping that we can start to uh, play around with text messaging post-discharge to remind people um, uh, what's important after they've gone home. Well, as you know, the future's already here. Our smartphones, FaceTime, Skype. Um, I visited my GP on the internet the other day. Um, and, and all sorts of other remote monitoring things like uh, implantable things that uh, Kendall alluded to, um, uh, which is just unbelievable. So the future is big, but it's already here and it's already starting. Um, I won't go any further, the sky's the limit. So thank you very much. Let me introduce our next speaker is uh, uh, Pat Camp, uh, Dr. Pat Camp. Uh, Pat is from the Center of Heart Lung Innovation UBC in St. Paul's Hospital, and Pat will be speaking about the use of remote management of, and rehabilitation of COPD patients. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, uh, Kendall, for the invitation to speak here today. Um, I'm going to be talking about, um, I guess, a similar uh, topic related to uh, chronic disease and uh, I'm interested in pulmonary rehabilitation. Um, I wanted to introduce a little bit about COPD for those that might not be familiar with it. Um, COPD is a very prevalent uh, chronic disease. Um, you can see this is from Stats Canada. Uh, it, based on self-report, um, COPD is about 10% of the population over 65 years. But in reality, when you actually go out and screen in the population, um, the actual prevalence of COPD is about 37%. So uh, many more patients have the disease than are diagnosed. So what is it? Um, COPD, it's a chronic progressive condition of the airways and the lung tissue. 
And it happens as a result of long-term exposure to uh, inhaled particles, usually in our uh, society it's cigarette smoking. It destroys the lung tissue, it also um, uh, impacts the airway walls, and so it's very difficult for individuals to breathe. And it's currently the fourth leading cause of death in North America. There's a lot of challenges for patients that have COPD that really make aging in place difficult. People with COPD have very severe shortness of breath, and so the impact of that is that it's very difficult for them to go upstairs, it's hard for them to walk, um, patients complain or t tell me that it's even difficult to laugh, they get short of breath when they laugh, and their sweet sleep quality can be really affected. When you have COPD, it's uh, quite common to have frequent respiratory infections. And so for some patients, that might even mean a hospital stay of one or two weeks and then a long period of convalescence. And then they may go back home and have a period of home where they're stable and then another <coughs> respiratory infection. So they're constantly being hit by infections, which can cause a real decline in their health status. When you have COPD, um, you have a problem with muscle weakness, and we don't understand if that's just from disuse or if there's something about the inflammatory process of the disease that uniquely impacts your muscle function, but the impact of that on patients is that it's difficult for them to do their activities of daily living. And they can have a, a real impact on their upper extremities, so it's even difficult to wash their hair or make their bed or, or cook. You use a lot of those muscles to help you breathe, so when you're trying to breathe, you're quite short of breath, and you're also trying to do activities, it can be really difficult um, when you have COPD. They're quite deconditioned, so it's also difficult for them to do their day-to-day -day activities, and there's a lot of variability in their symptoms. So you can have really good days, and then the next day it's really bad. And so it's hard for people to feel like they can participate in their regular daily lives because they're always canceling or saying, no, it's a bad air quality day, I can't go out. Um, and then their symptoms of cough and wheeze make it difficult um, for them. They feel like there's a real stigma associated that, with that. So pulmonary rehab is um, an intervention that is an exercise and education intervention for people with COPD. And this is the pulmonary rehab program at St. Paul's Hospital. And individuals come in and they exercise. Um, they participate in group exercise and group education and discussion. And the benefits are that they uh, have improved exercise tolerance. Their symptoms are, are much reduced. And they actually have a, a noticeable improvement in their quality of life. And it's very cost effective. It's one of the most cost effective interventions um, for COPD at four to eight thousand per quali. And if you're a quali person, that's basically negligible. But the problem is access. So we have a great intervention. We know it has health benefits. It's important for these individuals. It's evidence-based. But this is a um, diagram that shows where these uh, programs are in BC. And as you can see, I don't know if I get a pointer here, but as you can see, most of the programs are where the population is along, along the, uh, the border. But in actuality, the prevalence of COPD is at least double in the Northern Health Authority than that in the Vancouver Coastal, and they have no programs. And overall in Canada, less than 1% of individuals with COPD have access to a uh, pulmonary rehab program. So this would seem like a great opportunity to think about technology and how can we use different technology options to be able to uh, assist individuals to access pulmonary rehab, whether you live close to a program and you have difficulty getting to one because of barriers that you may have, or whether you don't even have one in your community. And there isn't likely to be enough hospital-based pulmonary rehab programs to, um, to provide for everybody. So we've, we're interested in this question in, in uh, our research centre. So um, we have uh, looked at some of these questions ourselves or we've partnered with um, other uh, organisations. So the home monitoring that Anne-Marie brought up is also um, used in COPD and it's typically used in individuals that have a lot of repeat exacerbations and are going into the hospital frequently. So it's kind of a hospital at home approach. They try to uh, regularly monitor um, blood pressure and ECG for some patients, but the real focus is on oxygen levels in the blood and heart rate. And the patients also answer some questions and um, they're, the information, similar to the heart failure approach, the information is sent to um, the nurse and then there are certain alerts that are, uh, that are triggered. 
And so this particular approach has been trialed in the Fraser Health Authority, and they shared some data with me. Um, it's called the Breathe Well at Home Project. And over um, the period of September of 2011 to March 2012, they noted um, some pretty important decreases in some of these uh, health service utilization events. So this is percent decrease. I don't know if you see that, yeah. Percent decrease. So ER visits decreased by 30% admits by a little more, length of stay, not as substantial, but still a 15% decrease in length of stay. And the readmission was the real, was the real uh, win in this scenario. The individuals, similar to heart failure, about 20% of these patients are coming back in 30 days. So for those that were discharged from home, they were able, or discharged to home, they were able to monitor them quite closely and see if they were relapsing and hopefully alter their treatment before the patient got so bad that they had to come back in for another hospital stay. So it's a um, pilot project in Fraser Health um, that um, was funded by Ministry of Health um, funding for a, a period of time. Um, and so there was some, uh, certainly some great hits that came from that. I'm interested in the rehab part of it and how we can use technology to actually um, uh, prescribe exercise, to monitor, to progress patients, and also to give them the tools that they need to do this on their own. And so we did a study looking at a Nintendo Wii exercise program um, to see if this may provide a similar exercise stimulus as traditional pulmonary rehab that occurs using treadmills and bikes and things like that. So we recruited, um, we recruited a small number. Uh, I think we had 15 patients, so still in these small numbers that we're talking about. Um, and just wanted to compare the exercise demand of walking on a treadmill, which is what happens when you're in a hospital program, to gaming with the Wii, um, the, with the Wii Fit. So these were individuals with COPD. They were all 65 and older. They all had severe lung function. None of them had ever used a Wii before. So this um, table shows differences in energy expenditure and some vital signs, shortness of breath, so that's the dyspnea scale, the RPE is the rating of perceived exertion, and in this case, we wanted to compare these things, we versus treadmill, so you don't want to see a difference, you want them to be comparable, and we certainly saw that for the total energy expenditure that we actually did provide a similar exercise load, the heart rate was similar, the patients perceived that it was as difficult as walking on a treadmill, which is a good thing in exercise. You want to push people. Their shortness of breath was similar. Interestingly, the Wii provided a higher level of oxygen saturation compared to the treadmill. And that may be because it's sort of a stop-start exercise, and so people had a chance to have their oxygen, oxygen levels come back up during the little pauses. So from this perspective, it was a good news uh, story. We were able to think, okay, if we were to use the we, at least we could know that we could deliver a similar intervention. And so then the next step is to actually proceed with a clinical trial to look and see if over a long-term period, can you get similar benefits. We're also interested in the portable monitoring, and there's um, a number of devices that have already um, been on the market related to portable monitoring, and oxygen levels and heart rate are sort of the classic um, vital signs that we're interested in pulmonary rehab. So we're currently doing a study looking at um, a, a few different devices, such as Lionsgate Technology has a, an actual pulse oximeter that works with a smartphone. <laughs> And you can see, um, and it's very inexpensive. It's been approved by Health Canada, so there is um, uh, the potential use for this in the healthcare industry. There's also other ones that are a little bit different. They may have a little watch that Bluetooths to your smartphone. So there is the devices available to be able to monitor the kind of vital signs we're interested in. And then also pairing with things, devices like Fitbit, there's probably a number of us that are wearing our Fitbits right now. Um, there is good evidence to say that simple, simple step counting, pedometers, Fitbits, that have the ability to store the information and transmit it, um, does show some benefit in terms of long-term adherence to an exercise program. So we're interested in these sorts of devices as well. But, you know, there's a lot of technology, and I think you've probably heard a lot, and there'll be a lot more to hear. I think that we need to take a step back and think as the people that are involved, both from an academic perspective and clinically, what is actually going to be important when we decide what technologies to, to uh, pick. And so 
we've, um, as part of our work um, with a, a team of, uh, of engineers and uh, clinicians and researchers, and Kendall's is part of that group, um, we're, doing, we're doing focus groups with patients and healthcare providers and policy um, people to really gain an in-depth understanding as to what is important. We're looking at what their preferences are, and we really want to get some insights because technology is going to just keep coming on the market. It's up to us to be able to thoughtfully select and adapt for our, um, for our patients. So based on our focus groups, there is the acknowledgement from patients and healthcare professionals that certainly, yeah, biosensors are great. You can provide a lot of in information that typically was in the hands of the healthcare professional, now is in the hands of the patient. So patients are actually kind of excited about that, that they get to be the ones to look. But one thing that hasn't been addressed by a lot of the technology is the between patient social interaction, which happens when you're in a group exercise program. Doesn't happen so easily when you're plugged into something and your communication is just between you and the healthcare provider. So how can we have that between patient interaction? They feel that it's important to connect with a healthcare professional, but a lot of our patients thought you didn't have to do it all the time. There's some weaning that has to happen so that we can continue on. And as mentioned before, you need rewards, you need something built in to motivate you. Obviously issues of safety and access and really understanding the health literacy and training. You know, like I mentioned before, we don't really all know how this stuff works, but it's also interpreting the information that you get. Um, and the fact that the one size fits all that has happened in the, in the past doesn't really work. We need to have this individualization. So I wanted to also say that, you know, I, I believe that we've gotten quite excited. I know I've gotten quite excited about the technology implications, but I feel that the, the field has moved quickly in regards to physician-patient interaction. And I think part of that in BC is because we have a fee-for-service model, and it was a fee code, and, and the technology was there. It's pretty video conference. Um, heavy and so a lot of that was allowed to kind of get up and running but if you're if you're employed by a hospital in a union with your insurance uh, and you know situated within the hospital you have a different frame of reference and so we really need to decide you know as a as a healthcare professional how much in-person contact do I actually need to have before I can really safely have a telehealth interaction with my patient who pays? You know, who is responsible for this patient? My liability rests with my hospital. Am I now responsible for someone who lives in Fort St. John? How do I set the boundaries? Some people and healthcare professionals talked about, are we going to be plugged in forever? Am I going to be monitoring this patient forever? How do I, how do I handle this? And where are the IT supports going to come from? that uh, we don't typically have now. So if the patient's device breaks, if my device breaks, we have to have a whole level of infrastructure there to support us that uh, we don't currently have. So in conclusion, you know, there are many aspects of COPD that raise barriers for healthy um, aging in place. And I do believe that um, technology can enable delivery of rehab and so exercise-based interventions. But really, I think, you know, we need a reliable, engagement, we, the system has to be multifaceted, um, obviously have a lot of the things that we can provide in that in-person group format has to be provided in, uh, in the technology format. And I think we all would be um, well helped or, you know, the whole system would benefit from a, a real deep reflection on policy implications, just the simple questions of who's responsible, who pays, oop, that's my own timer. Mm -hmm. And so with that, I'd like to um, just show the slide of some of the um, funding agencies, and thank you very much. So our last speaker for this morning's panel is uh, uh, Stephen Wilcox. Uh, Steve is uh, the design, from Design Science in Philadelphia, and, and again, his bio is available on your folder, and he'll be speaking about Care Pathway Navigation app. Steve? Thanks. Being the last speaker before lunch is always... Uh, Difficult. I'll be as quick as I can, but I've got about an hour's worth of material to <laughs> put into uh, about 15 minutes or so. Um, okay, so I run a practice uh, in Philadelphia with offices in Philadelphia and San Francisco that focuses on usability of medical devices. 
and uh, that's our funny little niche. And uh, but we, uh, in order to keep everyone from quitting, because our what we do is really uh, difficult and not always super sexy, uh, we do these fun kind of futuristic projects on a pro bono basis. So that's what I want to share with you. So first, I want to talk about some enablers, and then I'm going to show you a little a little fantasy app that we developed, and I'm going to have to blast through the enabler part uh, in record time. Okay. So first of all, the, these are some of the things that are coming online. Uh, one is uh, big data. So that's, there, there are at least three versions, three ways that big data is starting to have and is uh, going to have a huge impact. Uh, improving diagnostics and therapy. Right now, therapy is, is based upon symptoms, uh, but what's happening gradually, it's symptoms plus one's personal characteristics. And so right now, of course, there's some demographic variables that are being plugged in, but when DNA, when we know more about the structure of DNA and we start finding relationships, uh, things are going to change. Uh, likewise, outcomes research. We've got lots of uh, data about what kind of therapies work better than others. We have very little data, at least very little publicly available data about uh, the outcomes of individual healthcare professionals in individual facilities. Uh, the other thing we still know very little about is drug interactions. So because the complexity of the problem is, gets so huge so fast. But as we start uh, are becoming able to handle huge data sets, we're going to learn more about that. So that's one set of enablers, big data. The other one is the Internet of Things, and I could talk about this for an hour or so, but I'm going to blast through 100 miles an hour. Uh, most of what I'm going to talk about comes from this book. It came out a year ago uh, called The Zero Marginal Cost Society by Je Jeremy Rifkin, which I, one of the best reads I, I have uh, had in a while. Uh, and he talks about this thing called the Internet of Things. It's nothing less than a fourth industrial revolution. So uh, the, the, each of these, he talks about these complexes that in, uh, are, consist of an energy source, uh, logistics, which by logistics he means both transportation and manufacturing, and various forms of communication. So that what we're um, seeing is a new co such complex, a new revolution. So there's the first industrial revolution based on wind and water in the Middle Ages, and then there's the industrial revolution uh, based on coal and steam, and then the one we're in right now based on oil and so on, telephones and so on and so forth. And uh, the new one is based upon renewables for energy, uh, distributed manufacturing and free transportation, uh, and the Internet of Things. So um, anyway, we, it, there are various implications. But some fun, fun facts that sort of blew my mind. The Cray 1A uh, computer, supercomputer, cost $9 million, weighed five and a half tons, and had one ten thousandth the computing power of your iPhone. Uh, 88 minutes of the energy in the sun equals all the energy used by everybody on Earth for every purpose. Uh, and and uh, he talks about this too, is that renewables are all, renewable uh, energy sources are on a Moore's Law like tear right now. And if you look at the curves, it's, it's looking like uh, renewables, solar energy, for example, is going to be cheaper than the average cost of electricity in the grid in maybe five or six years. 30% uh, I believe now of um, Germany's uh, power comes from new renewables, for example. Uh, and then in the meantime, 3D printing is, is there's a whole world of 3D printing. That those of, I come from the product development world. We think of 3D printers as these things we use for prototyping. But there's this whole open source movement that's 3D printing houses and so on and so forth that you may uh, have seen them. So um, what we're experiencing, by the way, is the Napsterization of everything. If you know any musician friends, they've been turned upside down by N uh, Napster, of course, itself is illegal, but by the phenomenon. And here's the phenomenon. When the thing that you're selling becomes bits, it's impossible to protect your intellectual property. And so that's going to happen to those of us who live in product development and probably everybody else soon-ish. Talk to your musician or journalist friends if you want to know what the future's like in your field. Um, okay, so key changes. Ne near zero marginal cost of design, manufacturing, marketing. The way it's going to happen in product development 
is uh, with 3D printing, so that you have your own 3D printer, and then you just get, and then you you get the electronic, the the product becomes a, an electronic object that you print out via 3D printing, automated assembly, and so on and so forth. Um, profit goes away, as I say. Talk to journalists or musicians if you don't believe that one. Uh, the person as node, that is, the person becomes a generator of information and a consumer of information as well as a, quote, consumer. Uh, and there's this notion of access versus ownership, which uh, rideshare is the most obvious example. Um, so what is all this going to have to do with healthcare? Uh, these are things that are all happening right now, but they're in the nascent stages. Wiki Wikipedia like healthcare information, and there's, as I say here, there's some initial evidence that the, the um, that crowdsource diagnosis rivals and sometimes surpasses that of a physician. Real-time personal health data with closed-loop therapy. This is already true of implanted defibrillators, for example. You have a repeater in your house. The data is sent to your physician. If you need, if you have a uh, fibrillation event, you, it gets el eliminated in a closed-loop system that shocks you out of it. Um, drugs made at home. I thought this was a total fantasy. Uh, and, and there was an article uh, in the New York Times about this uh, about two weeks ago. Um, locally made personalized implants and assistive devices already happening via 3D printing and so on. And this is the other thing, this crowdsource medical research. So there are these self-organizing communities of people with various conditions, particularly chronic conditions, uh, that are doing all kinds of stuff, including medical research. And uh, the sample sizes, so, so for example, let's say you've got You've got a chat room full of, or, or uh, an internet group of people with diabetes. People voluntarily try therapies. Okay, so a thousand of us are gonna try therapy A, a thousand of us are gonna try therapy B. Now admittedly, it, you know, that's, it, you, you give up some of the scientific validity and control, but at the same time, the sample sizes are so huge that this is starting to get more and more attention. Just some other terms, patient-driven healthcare, open source health commons, participatory medicine, crowdsource medical research, okay. All right, so here's the pair, uh, care pathway. So we in our office, is the, there were a, a bunch of us have worked on this, have just started brainstorming, and here's the question that this is an answer to, is what if, okay, let's talk for a second about the Google navigation app. You used to have to know your way around a city. You'd buy a map. Uh, those of you who have a natural sense of direction had a great deal of superiority to those who don't. <laughs> now it doesn't matter. It's obsolete. Because what do you do? You go to a city, you, fall, you, you, you plug in where you're headed, and you get sent there. Now, you also tell them, well, whether you want to use uh, expressways, for example, and some other things, and then it chooses a path for you. Okay, so what if we had such a thing for healthcare? So here's our, at least our version of, and we've actually created, I've got it on my iPhone if anybody wants to, to see uh, uh, at, at lunch or what have you, because it, by making an actual prototype, it enforces a kind of discipline so that you can't just wave your arms, now, admittedly it's all fake, but at, at the same time, uh, we did make an actual prototype just to see what seemed to work and what, what didn't. Okay, so it has three components. It has a section called My Health, a second called Diagnose, and a third uh, treatment called Treatment Options. And let me just walk through those real quick. Okay, so here's the interface. And uh, first of all, let's go to My Health. Well, in order for this to work, it needs a lot of information. So it needs at least your current health situation, uh, number one. And it needs hist uh, history information. It needs to know about your family history and your personal history in terms of health. And you need to tell it, give it some preferences. So the preferences here, the dimensions that we could figure out uh, are cost, recovery time, likelihood of recovery, and, and uh, the amount of discomfort or pain you're willing to accept. These are four dimensions that we think uh, trade off against each other. Now, 
cost here in Canada may not be an issue. In, in the U.S., you know, where we're buying our health care, uh, the cost is sometimes, or often, the biggest, uh, e the biggest element that might be removed in the rest of the world, the, in the same part of the universe, in other words. So anyway, here, here are just some options. So here's a person that is most concerned about cost. Th these are forced uh, rank ordering. Uh, and uh, they really want to recover. Their second highest priority is the likelihood of an actual recovery. They're, they're willing to put up with a good bit of pain. Person number two here, uh, it really hates pain. They're willing to sacrifice everything else for minimizing pain, and so on and so forth, okay? Okay, now, here's the other thing, is that it's got to be smart. For the app to work, the person's not necessarily going to know what information it needs, so it's got to come back and ask questions. Okay, so in this example here, by the way, do you still have the flu? Uh, okay, all right. Now, now let's look at how diagnosis works. So in what, we've, uh, what we're proposing here is that it, it's an autofill auto kind of format, so it knows what the symptoms are you're putting in. So you put in symptoms. Let's put a few symptoms in here. Okay, so what do we got? Difficulty concentrating, snoring, headache, and dry mouth. Anybody? Sleep apnea. Sleep apnea. Very good. Uh, now, but it asks a few questions, right? There are going to be some questions that your doctor would ask you to, to, as part of the diagnosis, and you put in the answers. And sure enough, it, the diagnosis here is sleep apnea. Now, it has links so that now you can learn about the nature of this disease that you have. It tells you what you've got, and it uh, tells you some things about it. And then, if you choose treatment options, it gives you some options. So in this case, sleep apnea is a good example because it can be treated in so many fundamentally, profoundly different ways. Surgery, drugs, um, devices, CPAPs, for example, and so on and so forth. So here, the first choice for this person, because of their, the things that they uh, opted for, where our hypothetical person here doesn't mind pain, they don't care about, about the cost, uh, they want instant recovery. That's their highest priority, so surgery is the, is the preferred option. Okay, so then you, then you choose surgery, and now you've got the different kind of surgical procedures. As you may know, there are quite a few different kind of options. Again, they're rank ordered. You choose, uh, the, this is the pillar procedure, you choose the procedure now, it tells you about, gives you information, and the assumption here would be that there would be uh, uh, links to additional information on any of these topics. Okay, we choose the pillar procedure, and now we've got a list of providers of the pillar procedure that are all rank ordered, like uh, the Zagat guide or the travel guides. <laughs> so here, for example, if you see, it, it gives them a rank, an overall rank ordering based upon objective data. Here we, we, we're looking at re, uh, readmission rate, rates and uh, the successful recovery of, of their patients. And, uh, and then, in addition to the objective measures, their comments, you know, uh, their, their customer comments. Uh, just like in the, in the travel app. So you get an overall ranking, and then you can look through the comments. Yeah, he really has a nice uh, bedside manner, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and then once you get your, uh, your, your therapy and you've chosen your physician, it, then it sends the, uh, sends the information directly to the physician. And uh, so now, at, at some point, we've got to actually involve physicians, unfortunately. <laughs> Uh, and no, that's uh, that perfect timing. I'm, I'm done. So there uh, you have it. And here's the actual, I don't think in the, oh, maybe so. I wasn't sure if in, a, in the Apple world here it'll work. Maybe it won't. Yeah, I guess not. Anyway, I've got it on my iPhone if you want to see it. So, okay. Thanks a lot. A few years ago, I read about a, a white paper in the States called, um, oh, I can't remember what it was called. It came out of the Obama government, though. And it was about research and innovation um, in that research that led to innovation was more highly regarded. And I wondered if that was um, on anybody's radar, if the CIHR and the NSERC here in Canada 
link their funding to the possibility of innovation. Thank you. Anyone at panel? I could speak a little bit to it. I think that um, that certainly is the the desire to have um, more uh, partnership with uh, different industry. So CIHR and NSERC have partnered on these uh, collaborative research grants that also require you to have an industry partner and matching funds. And so certainly from the level of the funders, there is that, that interest. What I find personally challenging is that while you're grinding through the research process, uh, someone's already invented it, it's on the market, half your patients have used it, and uh, they've moved on to something else. And you haven't even touched on Health Canada's involvement in terms of approving it as a medical device or a healthcare device. So I think that, um, I think a, a different model is probably gonna need to happen instead of the typical innovation development model. Great. And maybe a quick short answer. The, the answer is yes, uh, because I sit on the CHR uh, eHealth Technology uh, Advisory Council. There's a lot of thinking about how to engage innovation to research, so stay tuned. Yeah. Other questions? Can oh, I sorry, yes. Uh, that's interesting. I didn't know about the report from the Obama administration, but several years ago, the NIH revised their criteria for funding, and innovation became an important factor in determining you know, it was an important piece of your overall um, score. Um, and and it, it's not only, the, in, the way it's um, translated is not only innovation in terms of new, but it's using an existing technology in a new population. So for example, like my focus of work on ethnic minority populations, taking a, a technology that's been used in um, one population and seeing how do you modify this to make it culturally available and accessible to different subgroups of the population, so. We'll take one more comment, please. Uh, I don't know if you recall just recently, Ken Burns had a, a, a documentary on cancer, mm -hmm. uh, cancer treatment and things like that. And one of the things that came out of it was like during the 60s and 70s, there was a huge amount of research to, in the laboratories around development of cancer treatments and things like that, but there was nothing coming out into the clinical side of things. And I'm just wondering, again, the, the ability to take all of the, the health research that we have and getting it into industry's hands to, to start to try and addre address some of those health issues that research has you know, investigated quite thoroughly. Panelists, any comments or questions or to that? I guess personally for me, I, I kind of go back to those policy questions. I feel like that the research is happening and that um, we're able to do a trial or, or an observational study, but then I feel like we stop because we still haven't solved the problem as to who's paying for it, who's responsible, where's the, you know, where's the liability, who's going to do what, what's the boundaries of care. Um, and until that conversation happens, I think the research will continue to truck along, but we haven't really figured out that engagement with the actual implementation part of it. And then I'd just like to add one thing. I think that um, it goes back to the disconnect. I mean, I see, I see industry doing a lot of research. I think that there's some, sometimes there's a disconnect between the end users and what the end users want and what the folks, you know, in, in the companies are doing. So I think that, again, it goes back to, you know, this bridging, the, the bridge. How do we work together with industry? How do, how do we find out what that end, end, end user really wants and needs? And, and, mm -hmm. and it's consistent with what you're saying. Great.